We need to pull the videotape. My tape? Why? I've made a huge mistake. But it was too late to do anything about it. Steve Holmes is a bastard. He doesn't even know who his real father is. What else don't we know about Steve Holt? George Michael Blue is a cool guy. His dad is a powerful executive working for this man. The girls like him just fine. Young and old, it doesn't matter. In the dark. Welcome back to Growing Up Punk, the podcast about punk rock and all of its friends. This is part two of a two-parter. My name is David. You're about to hear from Aaron as he interviews, finishes up his interview, uh, with Theo from Gob. Uh, of course, if you're familiar with Gob, you know, great band from the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s in the punk scene, especially up in Canada where we are located. Um, but regardless, if you're a fan of punk rock, if you're a fan of music, this is part two. If you didn't hear part one, go back, go listen to it. Uh, real quick, if you want to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, you can find us at Growing Punk Pod. You can also find us on Facebook as well. Just look up Growing Up Punk. Uh, I believe it's facebook.com slash Growing Up Punk Pod. Anyway, you can find our personal Instagrams and Twitters there as well. So go give us a follow. And uh, thanks to all of you who've been sharing the episodes. We want to see that continue to grow, help the show grow. Wherever you're listening to the podcast, make sure you rate it, you review it, you subscribe it. And like I said, tell all your friends. So without wasting any more time, this is part two of a two-part interview. It's Aaron interviewing Theo from Gob. Uh, that would have been uh, sucker punch, that is, anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it sounds like the name of a good for a song. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of there's probably bands there you call that and song titles. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. Just oh, man. Stuff, um. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's just say that uh, you are a very special guest because you are the first one to come back consecutive two weeks in a row. So congratulations. Well, um, I'm a glutton for punishment. <laughs> Or maybe I am, or we both are together, and double jeopardy, right? It, it cancels it out or something. But so yeah, I think we we ended uh, our last conversation just kind of talking about the transition from um, how far shallow takes you into the world according to Gob, and so yeah, I'd love to kind of hear what that transition was like for you guys as a band. You know, there was some, there was a bit of change in the sound, there was a, a gain in popularity, and just your music videos. And so I'd love to hear kind of how that um, affected you guys as a band and the tours that you guys were doing then and, and kind of all that. Yeah. So you're, you're, um, you're talking about, yeah, from how far to world according to God, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And just kind of that, that season of touring and kind of what was going on then. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, uh, I mean, I'm, I might, I know I said this probably, last week or whenever we had the last conversation um that that trends and when we played that record how far uh for you know a couple of years until you know our, our uh, we had released world according to god but you know and of course we went on that when we released world according to god they wanted to hear how far shallow takes at the time it was kind of like you know they didn't want to hear they wanted to hear the older stuff it just it always seems like I mean, I think that's a pretty, I guess, I guess a given for most bands like when they put out stuff, everyone's always to hear like the old plays, the older stuff. And, and that became more of a iconic, I guess, uh, classic record as well, uh, how far it did for Gob. Right. But at the time we released, you know, when we came out and I think it was, uh, I think we're doing that in 1999, 2000, when we did World According to Gob. Um, and that came out in 2000, I believe. Um, that was, you know, we had all these demos, Tom I, and Tom and I. And uh, I remember, strange story, um, the, Tom had these songs. And, of course, we were playing them. And one of the songs um, was I Hear You Calling. But all, it, all that song existed at the time when he played it to me or, or and the rest of the guys. Um uh, it just had just like how you hear the original, the song, like just the intro. Obviously, it was a, that was before it was recorded well, but 
it was just the two guitars at the beginning. The he got that with the other guitar kind of playing the rhythm in the background. So he just had that idea initially, uh, and they do songs because he'd have really have really exchange, you know, show each other riffs or ideas or melodies of songs. And I was like, holy fuck, that's I love it. Like there's something so cool and hooky about it. I, I don't yeah. know, something that I don't know, something that just I thought it was a fucking it was cool. Like I said, like, dude, this is cool. You gotta finish this. And the other guys in the band, <laughs> uh, they were kind of like, oh, whatever, like about it. You know, they didn't really, you know, because sometimes I guess, you know, I don't know if it's just a songwriter thing. Uh, you, can, you, know, you know, you don't, I mean, to hear something in something that's not really finished. Right. It's kind of like a weird thing because most people hear, when they listen to a band, they hear the finished thing. They don't know all the steps that were taken. Maybe it was, you know, maybe it was uh, two songs or three songs that was made into one song and it became this amazing song or it was written in 10 minutes or maybe it took longer. So no one knows the history of it. They just hear when it's the final thing and they know, oh, if it's a good song, it's a good song. I like it. Yeah. But there was something there and I knew. And uh, so I kind of was like, you know, I was stoked to, you know, tell Tom to, you know, and that became like, you know, a big song for God. Right. Um, so did the I, other I, guys kind of catch on to it and they, they liked it after that or did they hate playing Well, I think that yeah, they, they saw it. They, like, yeah, it, we're just talking in its infancy of oh, okay, there's, yeah. no, there's no vocal melodies. There's nothing. All it was is like the beginning part of that song. If you listen to, uh, if you've heard of the song, I'm sure you might yeah, have heard yeah. it. Oh, but yeah. before, the, t- before Tom starts singing, there's an intro to the song. Yeah. And that's all what the demo was, was just that intro. It just repeated oh, okay. uh, like uh, a couple times or maybe four times. And he was just, so he had an idea. Um, but he just said, oh, what do you think of this? And I, you know, kind of thing. And I was one, I was like, dude, it's like the back to the future moment. I think I, I remember <laughs> pulling, pulling over in the vehicle I was driving. I was like calling, dude, so you know that song? It's like... <laughs> I just listened to the demo or the tape or whatever it was on cassette he gave it to you at the time. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, it's whatever we do, it demos on a four track or eight track thing with a cassette thing or mini this. I can't remember. I know we had a mini disc recorder thing too, eight track thing that we would do demos on. And um, But anyway, it was before obviously Pro Tools and got, I mean, I think Pro Tools was around at the infancy as well at that time. But uh, we were analog lovers, and that's how that record was recorded. We got Neil King. Yeah, um, worked like with, like with Elvis Costello. He did some um, engineering on like with Green Day and Jawbreaker. Right. Um, so yeah, and is this British fellow that was really a super nice guy. He was really cool, and uh, we said, let's try getting someone like this. It's kind of like, you know, like maybe it'll help enhance this record or whatever. But you mean. And his production thing, like we wanted to record to, to analog tape, of course, and we did. And uh, yeah, it's, it was just a total. Uh, we had Blair, who helped engineer the record, who did work on How Far with us when we did How Far. So we try to keep that, uh, you know, that same kind of sort of vibe and energy on that record. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was like, obviously, we did a bunch of different songs. We did ones that were like, oh, I don't want to do, we never released a few of the songs that. We did a, a couple extra songs, I think, on that record that uh, maybe it'll come out as a B side one day. Who knows? Right. And was maybe it not. was it like a conscious effort to to do more of you know a rock record? Like it, it's still still a punk record. There's still fast songs and yeah, you know, you know it's, it, it was because you know what? I think it was because I mean, there is a there's a, there is a, a fast song like, uh, uh, like no for California. Or... Sorry, you know, regrets yeah. is kind of yeah more of a punky, but uh, even like the song "Looking for California" I think is on that record too, and that's more of a, like like a faster punk beat song, like more. Of, um, I don't know if you remember that. That one's got it's probably the fastest one on there. It's like, yeah, it's faster than No Regrets, but yeah, like like I said, it was like I think at that time we were just you know writing songs and we liked we because we liked everything. We liked stuff from like the, you know like Ramones, Police, like uh, fuck. 
you know, obviously like bad religion, no facts and rants right. and all that kind of stuff. But you know, minor threat to we a bit. We also listen to jazz on tour because we get t- tired of listening to punk bands all the time. Like you're playing with them for three months straight, and just, so it's like, oh, let's throw in you know, one or Miles Davis or something different or Thelonious Monk, or and then it'd be like, okay, you're tired of that. Let's listen to some old Johnny Cash or Patsy Klein or something. You know, you never right. know. Like just it'd be like it was like brought. You know, it was cool because it was always interesting to hear music that you didn't know or you're open to get open to new stuff. And that's the way we, because we loved um, that. And that's where we kind of came from. We came from um, music. We loved eighties music. We loved, you know, punk stuff. We loved everything. And, and, and I was, you know, the song was a song. It was like, that was the thing. I think that's where that sticks in, a, in our, in our type of DNA, I guess, for writing for music is, you know, there's always something uh, like you know, not not in every song, but most of us we have a uh, like there's a melody, there's a story, and then there's like a chorus that's you know leaves you singing sometimes and like or whatever. Like it it was just something that we loved ourselves as songwriters. We liked a good song. It's like how do you write a song that's good? It's it's hard to write a good song, right? Like, oh, yeah. Where it's like. You know, and it's all it's all different to, to different people. Obviously, you can have a hardcore band like The Refused, which I'm going to see tonight. But I was telling you, but um, and, and, and you know, yeah, of um, the song like New Noise, where it's like a fucking great hardcore, you know, punk kind of song that came out. Of it. But I mean, a lot of people wouldn't think that's a great song because they don't like they oh it's too heavy for me or he's screaming or I don't like screaming vocals. So. I mean, a song that's sung and it's written and it's got all this instrumentation, it's obviously harder to write, uh, in a sense, uh, something that's good or you feel comfortable. And that uh, we always felt comfortable. The songs that we liked, we did, even though they were, like, if it was more rock and roll or not as punk or a little bit more punk or hard, it was, we were always comfortable because that's what we were feeling and that's what we liked. It wasn't like, like, we liked the song. Oh, yeah, I like that. Oh, it's cool. I like it. I, I'm into it. It wasn't like trying to go, okay, I think we should try and do this, guys, because this is what's kind of cool right now. <laughs> yeah. I got my ear to the I got my ear to the street. If you notice why it's all red, it's because it's been laying on the street all day and now I know what's cool. So let's <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like it wasn't like that. We kind of just did our own thing. I mean, you know, Gob was like in the sense of a big huge collage of this different type of you know a gob of different types of music or punk kind of style we just did what we wanted and made us ourselves happy so we were never held to we didn't have to be held to a certain you know um, genre I think well right. even though you know yeah and I think that especially comes out in um, kind of some of your later releases but I think you guys did a really good job with uh, world according to gob like for myself that came out when i was in high school and it wasn't a dr- such a drastic shift that i was like what is this band it was enough that i recognized it but it didn't you know lose me as a listener um but it engaged me in a way that kept me coming back you know over and over again for the last you know 15 20 years that it's been out and it's still such a great record to put on. So I love hearing just the backstory of the influences because, you know, like you said, lots of different influences, lots of those I wouldn't know, you know, just by listening to it. But then when you say it, you know, maybe next time I go and listen back, you'll be listening for, you know, different melodies or different parts in the song that I would be able to say, you know, oh, this does, this sounds like it was influenced by, you know, jazz or something different, right? If you're just always writing punk songs they kind of if you're just influenced by punk then it all kind of just sounds like punk instead of you yeah know, having rock influence or jazz or whatever else yeah and i mean like and the thing is i uh, obviously our songs aren't really jazz <laughs> right yeah but, but I, exactly what it's like it it would be like if <laughs> it's funny because um i remember playing guitar when i started learning guitar like i taught myself how to play because i i love it i kept trying to figure out how to play even though you know i sucked i just spent hours uh, trying to like listen to things but i also took me myself um like when i was in the concert band at school uh i remember the teacher saying you know because i didn't know how to play you know you know trumpet saxophone or trombone or whatever and i just you know 
kind of went to the percussion section, which was, you know, I, it was easier because I didn't have to, uh, I didn't know how to play because these people, you know, so, but they, they also, the teacher's like, why don't you, we have an intermediate sta uh, jazz, stage band, like a jazz band. And it was like, whoa, I don't know, you know, and I had to get, you know, a book and like learn all these kind of crazy chords and stuff. And, you know, it was like another challenge. So I, I, you know, I did it. I went and did it and I just, I put myself applied to it. It just, I mean, I had the passion to want to learn my instrument, but um, I, not that I'm that, I'm that great of, a, you know, whatever guitar player, I think, but I mean, I just thought learning these different things, I don't know if this chord, these chords would ever come in handy, but um, it taught me about a little bit of the theory of how, you know, what, you know, what sort of how things sat into the mix and like when a guitar had these different kind of chords and it's kind of hard to do these kind of crazy chords when you're playing in a loud rocking band with chords yeah. and all that. But, but it still maybe understand uh, sort of a little bit of song structure a bit, you know, like it kind of was learning and without even me knowing, I just, it was kind of like something that was, I think all those things help. Like, yeah. Um, well, that's different, yeah. you know, the, the difference between being a musician and just a listener you know, if, if I just listen to punk music, well, then that's all I really listen to. But if I'm playing punk or something else, right, it's like, well, maybe I want to play something different. I might not like listening to jazz, but it's fun to play it because then I can, it influences the way I play. Instead of if you're just a listener, you kind of just listen to what you like to listen to. But when you play, sometimes it's fun to play stuff you wouldn't listen to because you're physically doing it. And it's yeah. just a different, a different feeling. Yeah, and that, I mean, if we were, like I said, it was just like an offshoot thing if we we're tired of listening to punk or new wave or metal or whatever, and then it'd be like, so Tom would throw on like Miles Davis or John Coltrane or something. And you listen to these amazing players, like these guys are like the, the soul that was coming out of their instruments, like they're fucking pouring out there. Like, and it's just like, fuck, I wish I could play that kind of passion into my instrument. Like, you know, always, well, I wish I could be like, you know, you always, you kind of like, you know, obviously those people are those icons and always be there. I don't know if there'll be anyone is, you know, good that, that obviously they mark, cement their, um, you know, abilities and stuff. So, yeah, yeah, no, that's awesome. It, so, it, as a legacy, I guess. Yeah. So what was uh, the touring like on, on this cycle? Were you guys touring full time in Canada and the States or what did that look like? So, pardon me, because I'm um, eating my late lunch. Yeah, uh, you enjoy that burrito. <laughs> how do you it, how do you know it's a burrito? You just it's seem like, you just seem like uh, I'm gonna make myself a quick burrito kind of guy. No, this one this one's a something of a, a creation here. I made a, I don't know. It's kind of like a bunch of different things. It's almost like. Uh, I don't know, just because I just need something to eat because I haven't ate all day today. So it was just like you called me right when I was in the middle of making some kind of cereal slash oatmeal. <laughs> cereal burrito? Crazy cereal, <laughs> cereal burrito <laughs> with, with nuts and uh, maybe cranberries. It's kind of like, a, it's almost like, I think I've created something like um, a, a new age hippie uh brunch meal oh well, that's that sounds right up your alley get getting in fights and hippie food well definitely <laughs> it will be if it's up my alley is going to definitely come down the other side like like uh uh the hoover dam runoff well there, there's an image for everyone like there's a lot of <laughs> looks like a lot of fiber in this yeah well i'm just kidding you, you're getting old man you need your fiber <laughs> just kidding <laughs> I got my metal mirror soul in here with my own mirror <laughs> well as long as uh, I'm, I'm we're kidding, not no, still I recording just, I just when something quick I just had to and when you, I forgot that you were and you were calling me so yeah. I mean obviously we we're going to edit this out of the interview I hope <laughs> oh dude um, no so if I, if I sound like I'm chewing on something it's not the uh, the, the dog's pet toy okay <laughs> But, yeah. So or my, <laughs> or my, or my own underwear. Okay. Well, that's that's good to know. Yeah. So, well, yeah. What did the touring look like? Were you guys 
you know, you know, trying to trying to be in the road as much as possible. Were you touring the states? What was that dynamic like? Any standout so, tours? Well, because that song, um, uh, I think we well, so that we already had that album come out, and we went and did a a, a video. We had a we had to, we had three different ideas or whatever to do a video for. I hear you calling, and then this guy that we were talking to in Toronto, you know. We kind of like you know things that we liked, and this was like I said, like two thousand. It's like I was into like you know, like horror B movie stuff and sci fi. I was like different kind of stuff and all that. And this guy had mentioned something about zombies or something, and then I'm like, let's yeah, let's do a fucking video. I like I like this guy he was zombie thing. So he had an idea of us playing you know zombies at a game of soccer to save the girl's life, um, and I, I was like, fuck. It was like I. It was like we got it. It was the fucking coolest like thing, you know. Thinking in our heads, we got to do it. So right off the bat, I mean, we were doing zombie stuff before. It was zombies were super cool. I think because you know yeah. how, you know, like it was probably, yeah, like way beyond before zombie. Like if you think that we were doing that in two thousand, because much music would play that video because it's Halloween kind of based. And then we had the Toronto Argonaut cheerleaders at the time. I, I, are they called that now? Or is it the same team or are they different? I'm the wrong person to ask anything about sports. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> those like, so football I guys. They changed their name. Yeah. I, I, but at the time, they were Toronto Argonaut cheerleaders. But they had the makeup on to be like zombies. And they were kind of doing sort of like, a, you know, an MJ kind of thriller dance thing involved a little bit with choreography and. So it was kind of cool that the way it rolled out. We did that late at night and that video. And I, re I just remember when that video, we did, it was like, it's it was like a special thing, like the soda video. You see that, you're like, holy fuck, this is like, is it like, we're, wow, holy fuck, we look way cooler than I thought <laughs> we did. You know, like it was like, yeah. and that made us, you know, it was kind of like, it was cool. And it was a big song. Like it was across Canada. And it was like, you know, in video games and stuff and, it was cool. I mean, it's like a song that, you know, that we wrote. And obviously, oh, we got a gold record from that album, too. Which right. Was really cool. Yeah. So what was the touring like from that, like across Canada? Did it? Did you notice, you know, shows selling out or growing in size from that? We definitely, because of um, the songs, like for the moment, No Regrets. And I hear you calling where, um, pardon me, was talking with food in my mouth. And those were, like, it seemed like we could almost do no wrong. We were putting out songs that we like. And the label was down with them, too. And, and it was cool, like, to make videos for them and have fun. And I got to dress up with Craig like that in the video for, for the moment as a cop with a mustache. And uh, eating donuts. So I was like, in that video, we played different roles and stuff, which was fucking fun. And I was back in the day. I was like, it was cool. It was really fun. I, I enjoyed that. And and that became the songs and the touring was all that kind of came in because those songs were made the songs bigger. And we were invited to play festivals and that. Yeah, yeah the shows would be doing well. Like, uh, you, what could you ask for more? It was sort of like, it was taking off. Like it was already had started and this <clears throat> sort of like it propelled it to the next, I guess. Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to sound cheesy, but it like, I guess whatever the next level stage, whatever it was. Right. But, but in my mind, I was just like, oh, we just were just doing well. Like we were all like, just like doing, we were just playing shows, bad people showing up and, you know, and then, you know, and then we just kept writing music and, uh, you know, and then we started. I think it was like a year later, year or two later, we were working already. And Tom and I, and I decided to live and got a house in Vancouver and just kind of like use it to rent it and just uh, write music, just we could live together and work, you know, you know, live, breathe, eat, um, and work together, like all, like, you know, just to get all the creative things. And it was like, uh, and then that was when we started working on uh, the foot and mouth disease record. Right. And, and this is before we knew we would, you know, end up working with Mark Trombino, who did like, um, yeah, that's uh, awesome. Blake, uh, Dude Ranch, uh, Jimmy World, yeah, 
uh, or sorry, Blink-182, Dude Ranch, and uh, Jimmy World's couple records. So they're obviously the American. And, uh, uh, fuck, the one. The Futures? Uh, I think he did that. I think he did one later one, but he did the one before that, which, uh, fuck. Clarity? Clarity, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That was why we wanted to, you know, that was one part we wanted to work with, so they love Clarity. And I thought, you know, he, that was our first recording with Pro Tools because we thought, we thought, uh, you know, those were just, like, we didn't know they were digital recordings because they sounded really good and still warm and they still had an edge to them. So, but at that time, you know, by then, Pro Tools, I guess, got better and the resolution and stuff. And, uh, but Mark did use analog too, like with that when they mix it down. And so they kept, they still had a, a thing of analog instead of it just being, so, which was interesting. Like, and he knew what he was doing and he had written with, worked with these bands and, it was a different type of a producer, um, more of an engineer, kind of like, oh, no, I like that. Let me hear it this way, hear it that way. You know, we did pre-production. It was, uh, um, fuck, I'm jumping all over the place here. Oh, I know you right. wanted to hear. I know you wanted to hear more about uh, World According to God because that was a real big record. Oh, well, that's um, okay. I'm, I'm just gonna, a... I'm just gonna pause the foot and mouth one because I kind of jumped into that without finishing it. Obviously, yeah. Yeah, well, it's all good. Well, but World According to Gob, um, the name, obviously, uh, I was getting the guys or whatever, Tom, I said, dude, this movie, The World According to Garp, which was Robin Williams was in. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. No, I don't recognize the title of that. Yeah. And so that was, I, I really liked that name, The World According to, because it suited, suited like the artwork we were thinking of, you know, Tom was like, I think we should do go like this with this artwork or go like this or have something like you know, like a sort of like a, like a relationship, uh, a love relationship kind of going, kind of going like, you know, you know, oh, it's like this, but it's kind of like, uh, like a fifties style thing. Yeah. It's I love the art like, Almost that. like a, like a popular mechanic <laughs> in the fifties or something. And, uh, but it's like, it's like a kind of a weird sort of Alfred Hitchcock kind of, or vibe or like where it's like a guy's coming through with a saw, but it's just like a hardware kind of thing, but it looks kind of, you know, it's kind of, but it's done in a different kind of dark manner, and yeah, and uh, and we had watched the movie, and then I just thought this is this record, uh, like you know, telling. I remember seeing the Tom. It's like I, it's this is sort of like the world, sort of according to us too, like this record. So that's how that became the title of it, um, of that album. Just to give you uh, some insight of that, I don't yeah, know that that's awesome. people really, not many people know that. I think I'm pretty sure. Like, I, it's not like we never told anyone, but that was something that was kind of like, you know, that kind of moved us, that movie at the time of watched, it's like, it was, uh, you know, I, I can't remember how long it was been out for a while at that point, but I mean, we were watching out, it was, I think in 99 or 2000, but it was, you know, I think it was from the later eighties or early nineties when it came out, hmm. but it's a really good movie. If you haven't seen the world, according to Garp. Yeah. You know, I'll have to go back and uh, see if I can and find it's Robin that. Williams. It was like a real leading role and it's all about his life and the growing up and then all this crazy shit that happens. And it's, it's fucking rad. It's a rad movie. Like they don't, I mean, it, yeah, I, I think it's a really brilliant movie. It's really, really good. Yeah. Well, that sounds cool. Did you guys break into the States at all or was it mostly kind of Canada where, where you guys were getting more recognition? Yeah, so, yeah, Canada was obviously that, and then, um, you know, and then we had our sights on, we wanted to go to, eventually go to Europe, because people from Europe were asking us to, you know, come ever since we are doing Too Late No Friends and stuff, and we were trying to figure out, um, you know, how to make it work, and, um, and, and, you know, to this day, I mean, even though we've almost gone as a band there, um, it, we've still haven't gone, which is really weird to a lot of no, people, and us, because just the way it's worked out, it's just... But Japan was, you know, okay, sorry, anyway, I'm jumping again. Um, so World According to Gob comes out, and then we do all that. We go, so the States, yeah, we started getting all these uh, shows, like on the Warp Tour as well. Because so we were playing on the Warp Tour before that record, and then on that record, we were asked to play a bunch of shows. I remember in Calgary, like, we were playing some shows with Green Day, No Effect. Oh, wow. And they asked, they asked us to play last at the Calgary Warp Tour. They told us to play because like, every day randomly they switch bands around who plays right. on the main stage and all or what time sometimes they play earlier sometimes later but they for that show they put us on late like right after they said Green Day 
on the one stage and then right after they play we have to start playing wow and then i just like oh my god we have to play fucking after green day and green day was obviously so huge and big you know like i was just like oh my god it's like <laughs> like you know it's Pretty like, it felt like everyone's gonna fucking leave everyone's gonna leave and it was amazing that the people in front uh while you know our crew was setting up and obviously we're you know still helping them out and getting our stuff but there's people gathered in front you know, chanting, God, 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 like, it started like hundreds of people, and in between Green Day sat while they finished one song, there was all this chant going, God, God, at the same, and it was so, the love was amazing, like, oh, it was just a, like, they so feel cool. that, like, our own Canadian fans, like, just fucking giving us that love, dude, it was just, it, like, it went from, like, no one's gonna stick around to, oh my God, this could be fucking amaze, amaze balls. Yeah. So, and, I knew it was amaze balls when we went into like as soon as Green Day end and they give us the thing they go okay start playing you know and we played soda right off the bat so we started with soda to get everyone so we just get everyone stoked and everyone stayed and you know they moved over from one side to the other while we were playing and it was fucking it got it was awesome and within the two or three songs like by the third song on stage I I noticed I turned around and there's Billy Joe kind of just standing on the backstage behind near my amp there. And it's like, holy fuck. It's really, and it was kind of like. Yeah, that's going to be a little you know, intimidating. Felt a little nervous. Yeah, it was intimidating. It felt nervous. And then uh, yeah, after we played, he stayed there the whole time. And then he came up to me and goes, hey, I'm Billy Joe from Green. I'm like, fuck, I know you are. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's like, like you guys are awesome. He's like, fuck it. Yeah, he's like, yeah, Green, green who? Um, green Bay yeah, Packers? So it was, <laughs> <laughs> so was kind of like, uh, you know. I said no, no, buddy. I don't, I don't, I don't do drugs. I don't want to buy drugs. <laughs> no, 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 I, no. I'm just kidding. No, he. <laughs> yeah, imagine I just pretend he's like a drug dealer. It's like, you want to buy some mushrooms? No, just totally no, insult the guy. <laughs> yeah, I totally walked past him. And, and, no, it it was like amazing, like because it was like it was giving this. Hey, you guys were, you know, you really you seemed to really enjoy the show. He was like, you know, shaking my hand. He's like, when I, I, you know, brought me on their bus. We had hung out and it was cool. Like, they were really fucking nice guys to us. And we kind of built a little bit of a relationship in the sense of that a bit. But um, it was cool, man. It was, they were super cool. And, um, you know, to see, like, you know, Green Day and No Effects, like, or Billy Joe and Pat Mike, I remember them rolling, we were, they'd be rolling dice and doing these card games. All, and, you know, we played maybe, you know, a week here at one part of the tour, another week in a different part. Right. And we were always touring across Canada or going somewhere else and crossing paths with, you know, and our management was obviously doing their best to keep us on the road and playing shows and, you know, forcing people to like us more and more by... Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't think anyone had punishing their course, eardrums, but... uh, punishing their eardrums, and uh, so yeah, it was definitely um, rad. It was fucking cool. I remember them playing me some of their new songs that hadn't been released yet. They were they played me a couple songs in the bus. Uh, and it was fucking cool. I was like, this is kind of cool. I got a little inside thing, and and Trey Cool was kind of like the little sort of like the <laughs> he was like the odd guy a little bit he's funny and kind of peculiar you know like he was sort of uh it was kind of it was it was he was fucking hilarious he, he would say things like you know that drum thing that you do at the beginning i go i don't play drums he's like well your drummer <laughs> it's like the drummer plays that doodle cat in that song and i'm like oh a bow bell he's like yeah i'm gonna fucking i'm gonna rip that off i'm gonna play that <laughs> and and i remember i think we were in pittsburgh or whatever that at that point and uh he fucking he um he played he uh he played that uh song because he knew i guess was watching them play and he whatever song was he started i don't even know if it made any sense but he played that <laughs> drum oh, that's amazing. yeah just as a joke i guess to bug you know, of thinking it's kind of funny or whatever yeah well that's a great song just as soon as you did that part immediately in my head is it's just that riff that day yeah, the from, from Bowville, yeah, that's a great song. Yeah, the blue cat, da, da, na, 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 na. yeah, yeah. Well, but that definitely, um, yeah, it's just it, whatever. It's just like it's just a drum fill, but you know, Gabe played that when he heard it. You know, when, when he did the song, he kind of whatever. And uh, so, going into that from foot and mouth is the or sorry, uh, 
uh, to a world recording job. And then, you know, we toured like extensively all over the place. And I know that it started playing in LA, like they started playing uh, uh, World or uh, I hear you calling um, in LA, but I think it was later. Like it was because it kind of, you know, because we didn't have a, we were on network in Canada, but they had a label in the States. So we're kind of on there, but we didn't really have exposure as much in the States, other than just like through the Warp Tour and just whatever kind of work we did ourselves in right. touring. I mean, we would go for three months on tour. I remember in 1997, and like we for three months, we would just tour the states. Um, uh, and I might have already touched on this last week or the last time we had a tour, but but yeah, we would just relentlessly go on these tours and say, okay, we have this sort of booked, and we had to kept, keep on booking stuff as we were going, you know, like uh, just did whatever just to play shows because we were like, hey, we took this, you know, no one, we're doing this for the next three months. And as much as some shows were, like uh, cool and fun and but uh, you know some are just like you know you get 20 pay for 20 to 30 people this is a yeah. you know you know that was just like you know the we just worked hard and you know the, it was that ethic of us going out and you know just kept doing it yeah well that's that's what you got to do especially then right there was no no social media online stuff the only way to get your name out was yeah. to literally get in front of people yeah and people had to either get a gig poster or a you know, read it in the newspaper or here. Maybe if you're lucky, if it was depends on how big the the big the place was or the, the venue, they would, you know, would be on the radio. But most of the times, it was just posters and you know, word of mouth. Right. But anyway, so us coming back to um, working on foot and mouth disease, where I was talking. I don't know if you wanted to get into that. Yeah, or, yeah, go for it. Yeah. So yeah, we were working on me and Tom were living in the house together that to working just on that record. And it was like a weird, it was a weird time. Like, uh, we just had done, I remember, um, okay. Just before, uh, nine 11, like 2000, 2001, we just had done in August, a video that we just finished getting. It was no regrets. And, uh, we just, done it. and maybe it was out for a couple weeks, two or three weeks tops, and then the 9-11 thing happened and then they they uh you know pulled pretty much anything that was on the radio anything you know like obviously having a song called no regrets on the time of 9 11 they just did they you know the whole radio world everything yeah. kind of went into the somber thing they had different it changed the you know certain things couldn't be played because people are sensitive and you know you're you know, emotionally distressed about the whole situation yeah, in the state. Sure. And all that. So they changed it. So No Regrets kind of got pulled out, like, the video, even though it's, like, it's kind of, like, it has nothing to do. It's more about, about you know, just, just taking a chance in life and just, you don't know, you don't know until you fucking, you know, just give it a shot and, and you don't know who you can fall in love with or take chances on doing anything that you love or whatever. And it has nothing to do with that, but that song got pulled out. But at the same time, like we had that release, but I remember when we were working on, um, we were living in this house one and, uh, that happened. I remember in the morning seeing the, the, like, you know, cause it already happened there earlier. Uh, you know, it would have been six o'clock in the morning, I guess our time. Cause it was there three hours or three hours ahead. So right. or maybe o'clock their time. Whatever the fuck, yeah, it would have been if it's nine. I think it happened nine and ten a.m. their time, so it was like six, six to seven a.m. our time. Um, I say we weren't up, and uh, I just remember, you know, because we would like write music, work late in the night, maybe watch a movie or whatever. But we were always working on music, and I remember that day when that happened. It was crazy because we were working on this, and that happened, and uh, and it was Tom and I lived in this house, and it was just like. Uh, fucking it was such a weird moment in time and we were working on the foot and mouth disease record it, not that it had anything to influence okay i was um, just gonna ask you to the influence yeah I, and that's or... why i just kind of sorry yeah uh, I, I, was, I was just gonna ask if that if that influenced anything on that record or not it's weird because we were in new york like i'd say probably like a month before that happened like we were out in New York, like at least a month or two months, maybe before that happened. And then, um, 
uh, then we were there like three weeks after it happened. Wow. <laughs> because Arista was interested and, uh, you know, wanted to see us play because we were thinking of signing us. And this is right before we were working on foot and mouth. We had some songs and demos done. So I remember going there and we went down to the World Trade Center. And you can just smell the fucking crazy um, harshness or this in the air down there. It was like a weird smell and a weird, uh, like chemical. I don't know. It was just, it just, yeah, I can't it imagine. Like a, yeah, you know, it's almost like, uh, I don't know. It was just like it had a, it, and it was crazy to see it because it's like you, this was a huge impact on the whole world. And then you're actually there to see, like, well, I didn't see it like happen, but you and me, I saw the, the remains of what area right. you can see all the all the pieces of paper and the love letters and the the flower and all the things it was just kind of like holy fuck it was so more um it's almost surreal to see that in person it was just fucking just pretty heavy hmm. such a crazy thing obviously but so in one um, sense how do you experience something like that and not have it influence you know because the song or... well well, the thing is that because we already had a lot of the stuff written, the music, and, okay, that's fair, and, yeah. and 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 stuff. So at that time, we were just kind of like recording it, and um, so lyrically, um, like lyrically, um, uh, most of the stuff was kind of written, and we we're just kind of get it all together, right? So, it, and it's it's sort of hard to write. Uh, um, uh, I, I'd say. Uh, I mean, when you write about something, because like, we're not really a political band, right? Right. Like, yeah, that's true. So. Yeah, it, it can influence in different ways. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to course. influence, you know, lyrics yeah. or music, but even just how you see but the world. Did, it and... did affect, I think, Tom, in the sense that he lived, he started, he moved there to, with his, um, which is his wife now, he's married, but when they went to lived in New York, um, and he was living there, and. And, you know, when Muertos Vivos, because that album became, you know, after that one, I mean, just kind of flash forward on that, but that was a lot darker. And that and that was to do with, you know, you know, war troops and people dying and just sort of like the world sort of seemed like, the, you know, financial crisis, every, all that kind of shit, things are going down. And like, you know, that it, I think it was that was happening in between uh, whatever, 2007 to 2009 or whatever. It was just a lot of shit was going down. Yeah. Just kind of like, so... And it was like that vibe was kind of there, but it was kind of like it just, it, I mean, we that album didn't come out to 2007, but it was, that was sort of a dark period of sort of things, whatever. And it was just, it, I mean, it was a different, it was a, a view, like, you know, when Tom was writing those lyrics for some of the hit songs. Um, and same with me, like I had a song called Face the Ashes, and, and it was me talking about, you know, someone, like I was writing about Tom's, you know, going to see his grandpa parents and burying someone mm. and just like the feelings of like you know and it was sort of vague the song but i mean i just didn't want it to be so descriptive like it was so obvious right. like it, we were th that song dealt with a lot of like you know just depressing issues and and death and you know and that's when tom like i think we should call it uh you know mortal vivos uh and and in the true name of it i guess in the no one is um uh Latin in the band, but we knew that the Spanish uh, Los Muertos Vivos was like the, the actual the Day of the Dead. Right. But I think that because we just like the, just those two Toms, I think it should be Los Muertos Vivos, and it was kind of more. And then we had that Guadalupe, uh, uh, Jose Guadalupe, whatever his name is, who, I mean, he wrote, drew all that artwork of Day of the Dead stuff from like a hundred years ago or whatever it was. Yeah. So it wasn't like owned by, it wasn't owned, it was free to. Oh, okay. It was free to, uh, you know, for that. So it was kind of cool that it was always interesting that whole thing where they celebrated life even when it was, you know, someone's life more than the dead. And it was like celebrating the dead in, in a happier way than. Right. You know, yeah. you know, so it was kind of like a cool thing and the concept of that and. I really, really like that record a lot. Like, anyway, I I jumped to Muertos after. Nothing. Yeah, well, and I do want to get more into that. Maybe on a, a different different episode, we can we can yeah, touch on those two yeah. albums. Um, yeah, for a bit on uh, 
foot and mouth. Like it seems like it, you almost went back a bit to you know so, some of your older influences and sounds. It's you know to me when I listen to it, it's you know more punk sounding. You know, just bigger, chunkier guitars than than world according to what's uh, what influenced that, or was it just kind of what you were I mean, feeling I think at that it's time? Just like a thing. It's like a like a. It's like an energy thing of what we, you know, what we were and the into writing and the songs the way they came out. Um, it was definitely um, like it just had this a different vibe. Like it was just, I mean, you know, we had. Uh, it's so weird because I, you know, that like I said, that was the album we wrote out of that house um, that me and Tommy lived in, and and you know that inspired us to write the you know lyrics of the time that we're at and. And, you know, we'd either be there for, you know, two or three weeks, and then we'd be pulled away to go on tour for a week or then come back to the, and we'll keep working on the new record. And, and, and that was a whole a different thing. Like, I mean, our, it was, things were changing. Like, you know, obviously, um, you know, we were getting more popular. And then, you, you know, at that whole time, too, you kind of, people, you know, like, it wasn't it was mounting any pressure on us, and we were just trying to write songs that we liked, and that's what we, we kept doing. We've always done that. So, um, it's just the time period of capturing, I don't know how to, it's just like, you, when you write these songs, that's just the what came out. So, when right. we start writing, and, um, and like I said, if both me and Tom are writing, we have a whole bunch of songs, and we go, kind of the band goes, oh, I like this one, and that one, I'll play that one, okay, play this one. And then, it sort of becomes the album because it's like songs we're hearing the demos that we do ourselves. We go, that one's cool. That one's, I like this one. I like that. And then you pick all oh, these are my 10 favorite. You know, if we did like 15 or 20 songs or whatever. Yeah. We, you know, we write a bunch of stuff. It's just like, we kind of, it's just a natural thing of like sort of we you kind of wean out the ones that were good. There's the other ones are, oh, they're good, but they're not, you know, this one has something to it more or something they like. We kind of do it like, you know, in a sense of a democratic kind of style of what ones are stronger or whatever. If you like they're, they mean something and they're cool to play live or they have cool riffs and the lyrics are rad and or whatever, like all those combination of stuff. So, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's a great record. There's, there's some uh, big songs in there too, you know, give up the grudge and old Ellen and, um, did that kind of did things keep um, kind of moving forward with that? Yeah, I mean that's where we were actually told to go. We go. We we signed with Arista. That was like a major label. Uh, they signed us, and they you know they had like Outkast, uh, Pink, Aretha Franklin, Avril Lavigne. Like they had the, this huge roster of like huge artists, you know. And that was at a time I guess Avril was a huge album. They sold like 15 million of that one. Yeah, record. that's crazy. And. So was that you what know, you they, toured they with They didn't her? really have like a real punk yeah. band, I guess, on the label, I guess, or whatever you wanted to call us. Like uh, that's a style of what we were doing. Like you know, whatever it was to them, it was kind of like I, I kind of think that that was sort of like you know the way major labels they kind of chew bands up and spit them out. It's like oh, what's cool? Yeah. You know, what's cool now? It seems like all these bands are cool. Like all these punk bands are coming up out of fucking uh, springing out of the woodwork here. Let's fucking start getting, you know, let's start saturating fucking everything with these punk bands. And, uh, I mean, yeah, I know that DreamWorks was interested in signing us and, and, uh, and so was Arista. So we, it was kind of like, where it's like, it's, it's like a weird game to play. Cause it's like, you have your management and then you have, you, know, you get lawyers, you got a contract, you got to fucking read this bullshit. And it's the part that sucks about being in a band, that part, because it's like the business part, you know, and that's where you have managers and stuff and people hopefully in your best interest to take care of, you know, fuck you over right. or read the fine print and all that. But, um, yeah, and Arista was actually believed in it. And our guy was like, seemed really cool. And, and they're the ones who offered and we're like, okay, you know, like, sounds cool. Like, I mean, and, you know, and they wanted to spend money and like, you know, on, on us and, you know, and videos and stuff to, to make us. And then, you know, we just set, we got a tour set up in Japan. We, you know, we were, went there twice. It was fucking amazing. Yeah. Wow. Is that, you know, we went to Australia and stuff. It was, it was fucking cool. Like it was very, you know, when we showed up in those parts of the world, it was just like, cause Arista or the, the, the record label, the only the thing that was kind of cool about it was, um, the cool thing about it was that um, 
they actually had all these rap representatives that showed up there that would like kiss our ass. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be like they would take us out to dinner, get us like drinks, or yeah, have a you know fine bottle of this, get this or whatever. So I guess that. But then you realize, wait a minute, this you're we're we're paying for this, and yeah, it just goes against your ledger, <laughs> right? So, yeah, and that people don't realize these things. I mean, back then it was different because now, I mean, I don't even know if they're doing the new deal, three sixty deal, where the labels take money, you know every part of your orifice of your body like you go on tour tour you make money on selling merch or whatever right. it depends on the deal that you signed obviously the indie deals and you can do stuff independent which is so rad about the uh internet and online and and, and streaming platforms it's like you can do so much more now than right. you could sort of uh bound um in a sense it was hard to it's a lot easier as an indie art, artist i think um, no, I mean, there's still lots of saturation of artists now. It's kind of like, but I mean, it's easy for someone to go, oh, well, you're in this band. It's like, oh, then you can just click on a link and listen to them. You don't have to, you know, you can just watch a video on YouTube or whatever. You can hear them put it up for free or, you know. And yeah. it costs money, you know, to make these fucking records and these albums cost. And a lot of those bigger bands that do well, it's, it's like they get money back and have to obviously to pay for all that kind of shit. But, and it's like we, you know, we had to think about the future too of that stuff when that started sort of kind of coming in. It's just like, and lucky, I mean, over the years, I just learned a lot about engineering and, and, and stuff just using my ears and just, you know, asking a lot of questions and just being involved in recording it since I started playing in a band. So, I mean, and yeah, there's so a lot of like working on your own stuff, like, you know, like Martel's Vivos is like, you know, Tom and I just had to record the whole thing. I mean, we went and did the drums in the studio, and uh, and we had obviously um, Paul Silvera, which was he's amazing. He mixed the album. He also recorded the drums with us there too, and we did the drums and the baser. But that I mean, we needed, but we actually did the whole record, and we it was demo drummed, but we recorded everything else really good. So we so when Gabe actually played the drums to that record. He played it to all the vocals, all the guitars, all the leads. Everything was already there. So it was like him listening to the band playing. He played along, even though you know he knew what the songs were before. It's just like it just it just was a it was a different thing, but it worked out really cool. Like he was he played along listening. You know he had the demos, but and he learned obviously and he played the songs. But when we went into the studio, usually you start off okay, let's track the drums first. Okay, and then someone plays a scratch track, and then so the drummer knows where he is, right? The song, or maybe a, a a rough vocal scratch, and so the drummer can play along. And you build it up from the drums, usually bass or the guitars, the you know, like, and then you add the vocals in, and, and you make your record. And you that so this one, uh, that one, we we actually did it. We did the demos, but when we did the guitars and the vocals, we actually we redid them and made the vocals and the guitars like recorded them as, as high as quality we could uh, and everything. And we did that. And, you know, we rented preamps and all this stuff to make sure that the guitars, it's easier to get a good couple preamps to record like two mics for the guitar, one, you know, one for the bass or two for the bass on the DI or, and the one for the vocal because they use less, uh, it don't use as much gear in the sense for recording where you, or, or drum set, you need, fucking 12 to 20 tracks of and all these mics and these channels yeah. so it's a lot more and you have a nice room so that's why we're like we, we did it we tried it, it fucking worked awesome it was it was so good that it worked it, it gave you know because usually drummers don't get to drum along to a finished record like right it, yeah that's pretty special know, so he's good to hear so we could be like oh you know what and then you can tell that you know this fill that fill works really good there. Maybe you should try a different fill it because he's, you know, it's because it's all done. So it's kind of like it's kind of cool. You can change a, a few things up, and it was fucking. It was very interesting. We did that for both records. Um, for uh, uh for for um, Muertos Vivos and Apartment Thirteen, we did them that same way. Mm. Wow, that's uh, that's awesome hearing all those details. And I, I would love to to get more into those two albums. And maybe we'll save that for. For another episode, we'll um, yeah we'll, we'll wrap up here pretty soon. But I, I wanted to um, to get your take on if if you had to pick your top three records 
what would it be and just touch on on each one and maybe a memory from it or how it's influenced you as um, a songwriter and a, a fan of music wow top three just throwing that at me well hey i I sent that to you like two weeks ago you had lots of time to think about that Uh, did you actually send me that (laughs) part of the request yeah i I think i did have it on there oh you know what because i read some of it uh, what you sent me last week so after we kind of did that first i thought those were the questions you wanted from that first interview it's all good yeah i'm just kind of just joking i mean yeah it it could be to kind of just on the spot think of it could be any three. It could be top three oh, punk records or current records or just whatever comes to mind. Oh, fuck. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> top one put me on the spot. Um, or just, yeah, three three that come to mind. Three, okay, so um, I'm going to say... Uh, okay, a, a, a big record. I'm thinking. I'm not looking at anything up. Um, I'm just so you know. <laughs> I'm just thinking because I was like, I was picking between the two records, um, and I wanted to see all the rest of the songs were on the records, but because I wasn't sure if it was because um, one of them would for sure. And this is in no specific order, but one of them for sure that come to my mind is like uh, the Regatta de Blanc or the Outlandist de Moore. Um, and I, I know Outlandist de Moore was the first police record. And the second one was the Regatta Blonde, which had message on a bottle. And I remember, I just remember when I hearing that man when I was younger, and I just because they kind of had like a a reggae ska punk hmm. sort of thing going on, and some other. And I remember hearing a B side to a seven inch of Roxanne, where it had a song called Landlord, um, and they had a tr- guitar like it's like talking about the landlord getting kicked out and so it is like a fucking it's basically a punk rock song but it's just kind of like and it was when the police were like way more kind of energetic even like in their old, you know, earlier so ah, fuck i probably want to say outlandish the more is probably a, a big record that um that uh influenced me like like to of music. Um, another one that was amazing was the first Van Halen record. Mm. Um, first Van Halen one. Fucking amazing uh, record. Um, uh, fucking Master of Puppets was a fucking one in the metal genre going into, right. you know, getting, getting into Iron Maiden and Slayer and, and all that. Like that was like a, a gateway um for me, um, fuck a three though. Like I, I know I just gave you three, and I didn't give you any punk bands really. Oh, but it, it doesn't have to be. I, I know I just didn't want it to be so contrived. Like I was, I get those just popped into my head. Yeah, so, no, that's I mean, that's I mean, great. I mean, I obviously could say things like the first Minor Threat record were like fucking amazing, or the first Ramones record, like, uh, you yeah, know, which are oh, fuck, it is amazing. It's like. Um, but I mean, like it, those still those records, it, you know, made me learn guitar and learn guitar. But I still liked playing. You know, it didn't have to be always crazy fast metal riff this and that. It was like something that was simple that was good. Yeah, it was just good. You know, it didn't matter. You know, whatever. So even like, in, like in the case of the Ramones, it's just like, you know, if there was no Ramones, there wouldn't be a Green Day. Right. You know, even though Green Day is kind of like a mixture of. Like the Who and Motley Crue, I guess back in the day. But even like, like there's so many, like, yeah, and the Who and the Motley Crue old records too. Like those were like cool records. Like growing up with all the different types of music. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, no, no even no. like I mean, I, Dinosaur Junior and Sebado too. Like I was in the indie kind of rock stuff. Like I was into those, you know, like uh, um, Bubble and Scrape, like the Sebado record. And uh, uh, Dinosaur Junior Bug, I know Tom kind of introduced me to those records back in the '90s, and I was like, "These." And, and, I, and you know, I, I saw him a couple of years ago, Jay Masters, uh, Dinosaur Junior playing in the Commodores, a fucking rad show. Um, yeah, I mean, like I, I like I said, I like so many different kinds of music. I'm going to go see the Refuse tonight, and you know, and they're fucking awesome. So I like, you know, I'll go to. I've been to, you know, I'll go to In Flames show. I mean, their older show that I haven't been to the new. I don't, I'm not as much into the newer stuff as much, but but I'll go to shows that, oh yeah, I, I had that record or, um, you know, my friend played there. Or I'll get invited out and 
and I, I go, I'm always going to shows all the time. I like going to see live shows or bands that can fucking make me feel some kind of emotion or something when I watch them. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Like the Descendants, like somehow I made it backstage and watching them, you know, fucking play. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bikeage or whatever. I was just like, and seeing Miles thing, I was just fucking. I have I get one of the videos are on my Instagram thing. I'm like fucking, yeah, like fucking screaming my ass off. I was so stoked to see the Descendants play, and like, even though we, I've seen them play it, like I've seen all in them play it, but it was just cool to see them in Vancouver. I'm just like, was it a couple years back or whatever? But yeah, I had tickets yeah. to see them um, in Winnipeg at Thanksgiving, and there was this massive storm, and the highways were closed, and I. Just couldn't go. Such a waste. Wow. That might have been my only chance, but hey, that's that's how it goes. But dude, I yeah, I've loved just getting to hear your insight and stories and I I hope uh, we can do this again. So thanks for sharing your time and your uh fiber cereal burrito there with me and and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's been awesome. I really, yeah, I I've really appreciated just it was more know. nutty than fibery, but I think there's the yeah, there's still fiber in there for sure. Wait a minute, I gotta go. No, I'm kidding. Well, you, you can uh, shoot me a message we'll tomorrow with, uh, with how it oh, went. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. What so you that? can send me a message tomorrow with how how everything uh, turned out. I'm just gonna. I think I just kind of threw something together really quick, and I was just like, and then when you called, I'm like, I gotta get this going here. I'm like trying to mix it up, and then you get it as well. I'm doing the interview. And trying not to eat uh, no, that's, too loud and, and while I'm talking. And fucking well, food. that's that's all good. That's that's life, and we just uh, keep, keep rolling. So, so. Keeping it real. Yeah, always. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, yeah. Thanks again so much, and uh, no problem, Aaron. Yeah, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll talk again soon. See you back, man. All right, see you. Dude. George Michael had never been more embarrassed.